everybody. Welcome. I'm Kathleen Johnson with Prairie Lights, and before we start, I just want to quickly wish you all a happy Women's History Month and tell you that we are, yes, yes, yay, Women's History Month. And um, since some of you seem to be interested in this kind of thing, I should let you know that we are also having an event in store on Friday with uh, UI professor Natalie Fixmer Oray, who will talk about her new book, Homeland Maternity and 20% of proceeds of that will go to Planned Parenthood. So, so that's our Friday event. So, um, it very lights at seven. So, welcome. Good evening and welcome to the Iowa City Public Library. I'm Kathleen Johnson, the events coordinator for Prairie Lights, and tonight I am pleased to present Cecile Richards in conversation with Iowa City's Monique Galpin, who will talk about Richards' new book, Make Trouble, Stand Up, Speak Out, and Find the Courage to Lead. Before we start, I'll just give you some basic instruction of how things are going to go. Um, thank you to the Iowa City Public Library for hosting this event with us. Um, there are some slips of paper out there. They were outside the door where if you would like to ask um, a question, we can have you write it down on that and we'll collect them about 10 minutes in. We can, I can, I can bring some more in and, and pass them out as, as we start. Does that sound? Some of you would still like one. Okay, all right. I didn't. I wanted to make sure we didn't miss anyone. So, I'll um, I'll bring in some of the paper, or if maybe one of maybe if someone wants to come in and do that. Um, so, write your question on the index index card or slip of paper, and we'll collect them, and then Cecile will answer as many of them as she can. Um, after the event. Cecile Richards will remain at the front here, and those of you who need to go can go. Um, we have some signed books outside um, if you would like to buy one um, from your friends from Prairie Lights. Um, and she's, she'll remain at the front, and she'll be happy to inscribe books for you. Um, you can take pictures if you like, but please don't ask her to pose for them, or we'll be here all night. Which, um, Okay, and the library staff will dismiss you by rows, so you don't have to stand in line. I'm not used to this much nonfiction. Okay. <laughs> All right. Now I'll tell you a little bit about Cecile Richards and Monique Galpin. Monique Galpin is the chair of the Emma, Emma Goldman Clinic Board of Directors and coordinator for the Summer Health Professions Education Program, which is a pipeline program for underrepresented students in health professions at the University of Iowa. She also serves on the UI African American Council, the Iowa Sickle Cell Symposium Planning Committee, and is an advocate for reproductive rights and a feminist approach to health care. Cecile Richards is originally from Texas, daughter of the famous Governor Ann Richards. She went to college at Brown University and later worked as a labor organizer in her native Texas, California, and Louisiana. She has served as Deputy Chief of Staff to Democratic Leader Nancy Pelosi. She's the former president of Planned Parenthood Federation of America and Planned Parenthood Action Fund, and the fe was featured speaker at the Women's March on Washington. Among many other things, because I'm sure I've left some things out, um, she has campaigned for Hillary Clinton and serves on the Ford Foundation Board of Trustees. She is now also an author and currently lives in New York. This book is much more than a memoir. We're so appreciative to have her here tonight to not only talk about her experience, but to encourage us. Now is the opportunity to build a truly intersectional, interracial, intergenerational women's movement. She encourages us all to look for ways to make our communities, workplaces, and schools better places for everyone and to start making trouble. Please welcome. Meet Galpin and Cecile Richards. I don't know, can everyone hear me? All right, well, thanks for uh, coming out on a Tuesday night. Thanks, Cecile, Iowa yep. City Public Library. Um, yeah, very excited to be here. Do we have any um, elected officials here? Just want to make sure I 
Well, then some of the folks here need to run for office, I think, if, if no one's elected. Right. We'll get to that later, though. Okay. Well, it was such an honor to, to be asked to do this with you today. And um, I, I have to admit, um, probably to Kathleen's cast, uh, consternation and your publicist's consternation, it took me forever to commit to this because I was you know, questioning my own qualifications. I was thinking there are probably going to be so many, like, you know, Iowa City kind of has, has an embarrassment of riches in terms of, like, qualified badass women who could do something like this <laughs> <laughs> and so you know I, I had a lot of self-doubt but fortunately I I read your book and it was like this is something I need to do so um, well, thank you. were there any times that you ever doubted yourself or faced your own imposter syndrome and how did you overcome it I, I know I can't believe you said that because <laughs> I think we've all been through um, or a lot of women I know have faced the same thing and I write about it in the book actually that I almost didn't go to my interview at Planned Parenthood for the job because I thought I wasn't qualified. Because of course I'd never done anything that big or um, important and even though I'd been a nonprofit um, and I, I'd been a nonprofit leader, I, I thought this is too much. And I remember I was supposed to go to the interview and I panicked and I just thought I can't go, I just can't do this. So I did what any self-respecting grown woman would do. I ran and called my mother and uh, <laughs> I was like, I said, mom, this is just, I can't do it. The kids are too young and we would have to move. I mean, I was like going through all the reasons why it wasn't gonna work. And she just said, Cecile, get over yourself. She said, this is like, this is the um, most important organization in the country that provides women's health care. What an opportunity. If you don't go to this interview, you will never forgive yourself. So it was my mom, Ann Richards, and everyone needs an Ann Richards in their life that yes, just tells them yes. to just do it anyway. And so I feel like, and it changed my life. Mm -hmm. Maybe this, maybe tonight this will change <laughs> your life, who knows, but we all have to just do things that seem a little bit scary because that's, that's where the real opportunity is. And that's what I've, I feel like I write about it in the book, but I've also been talking to women more and more about it. I just think this is the time to start before you're ready. And if you just have that motto, <laughs> things will go well. Yeah, sometimes um, as women we feel like we, you know, we're not qualified for the same yes. things or we feel like, oh, we have to have 100% of the, you know, qualifications like checked off before we go for things. So yes. sometimes you just have to jump in. Just go for it. Yeah, yeah. that's right. Yeah. And so, um, you know, sometimes people don't think that they're cut out for activist work or they think that, mm -hmm. you know, they might not be academics. Like, you know, here in Iowa City, oh, I might not be an academic. I might not have, like, I might not be up on the most recent scholarship in this field or anything like that. But um, and sometimes I feel like they have too much to lose. But can you speak on the work that you did with women in the labor movement in New Orleans um, when you were fresh out of college mm -hmm. and um, discuss the power of mobilizing the working class? Sure, well that was probably my most formative, I guess, job experience when I, I, um, I went to college at this university where there was just so much troublemaking going on all the time. And then of course, and I actually write about this that at the end, you know, when I was about to graduate, I was like, okay, now what are we doing? You know, because we've already, you know, we've already made trouble about like divesting in South Africa and we've taken over the university buildings. And, we, and then I realized everyone else was kind of like going to get regular jobs. And um, <laughs> <laughs> because no one was really recruiting on campus for organizers. Um, so, but I left, I left the university and went to work with garment workers actually first on the, on the Rio Grande border. Uh, and then I moved to New Orleans and organized hotel workers, women who were earning the minimum wage, um, many of them um, taking care of kids on their own, many of them working two jobs because, you know, it was hard to, hard to make a living. And I've always, I'll never forget those years. And then I worked with, um, I worked with nursing home workers and janitors and really folks earning minimum wage all over the country. And yet here are these women who, um, they had nothing to lose. I mean, they had, they had everything to lose, right? They, it, you know, they, they were already living on the margins, and yet they were still willing to come together and try to organize a union to make things better. I think partly for themselves, but really because they knew there were going to be women coming after them. That if they didn't do something to make it different, it was going to be the same for generations. And so it's interesting now um, when people say, oh my gosh, you know, your job must have been so hard at Planned Parenthood and all that. And I say, like, you don't know what hard is until you're cleaning 15 rooms in a New Orleans hotel for minimum wage every day. And um, to me, those are the women and men that I kind of, I feel like taught me so much about life and about what it means to really be in the struggle and risk things to make life better. Um, 
and they were almost all women of color. Um, and I think, I, and I write about this in the book, and I've been talking about this a lot lately, I think that there is some growing recognition, but still not enough, of the role that women of color have played in this country to move us forward collectively, and how much we all not only owe to them and should lift them up, but also um, talk to other women, particularly white women, about what we're going to do now, and not just expect women of color to save us <laughs> from what's going on in this country. So, um, but it was a, it was a really, it was really formative work. And um, whenever anyone, a young person, asks me, you know, what do you do when you leave college and know, don't know what to do, like just go out and get an organizing job because you'll learn more from listening to people than any other degree you could get. Yeah, that's great advice. Um, so in chapter six of your book, it's titled Don't Wait for Instructions, but it happens to be full of wonderful instructions. <laughs> so <laughs> would you be able to um, share um, from chapter six, it's um, page 123. Okay. It's um, the part that starts with, um, yeah. I've never done this before, okay? <laughs> Read from my book. So, just go with me, okay? Right? <laughs> Money wanted me to do this, so I said, okay, you're, you're, you're in charge. Um, okay, I, I, might, I meet people all the time who are considering starting their own organizations, whether it's a student group on a college campus or a national initiative. And if you're thinking of giving it a shot, here's a few things I learned so that you don't have to. Um, first, be practical. Set a goal you can achieve something concrete. In the beginning, it's going to be small wins. Like, I knew I couldn't start the Texas Freedom Network by myself, so my first goal was just to raise enough money in the first three months to hire an assistant. Um, second, you got to be willing to ask for money. And I know there's a lot of people in this audience who probably do that all the time for causes that you care about. Um, it tests, um, it's a great skill to have. It tests your proof of concept. Because if you can find people willing to pitch in $25, you may be onto something. And there aren't any shortcuts worth taking. How many nonprofit meetings have I been in when someone says, Maybe we could just get Oprah or Matt Damon or Beyonce to do a fundraiser for us. That's just not how it works. Raising money isn't about getting only about getting an influx of cash. It's about being able to prove that other people support the idea you're working on. It's about building a following. Third, for better or for worse, when you start and run your own organization, you own all the successes and all the failures. Big risk, big gain. It's like being an entrepreneur, only you're not trying to make a profit. Fourth. Master the organizing rules of the road. Always have a room that's half the size you need, but half the chairs you need, so you can guarantee meetings will be standing room only. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> when you're starting out with new leaders, make sure everyone has the chance to speak. That, that will be the single best test of whether the meeting went well. Did they get a chance to give their point of view? Besides, you learn more from listening than from speaking. Of course, getting people in a room is 20% of the work. The other 80% is having something meaningful for them to do after they walk out the door. And no matter what you do, never forget the basics. Provide name tags and food. Start on time and end on time. Have a next step. Have fun. And remember, if I can't dance, I don't want to be part of your revolution. <laughs> there are a ton of great ideas floating around in the universe, but the ones that end up becoming reality are those someone commits to doing no matter what. Why not you? <laughs> Why not you is a key takeaway. I think so many people really need to hear that. And like, yeah. you know, you can start small, start where you are. And well, I think more and more folks are, and I think that is what's inspiring now, is that everywhere I go, folks are starting new organizations or just gathering, you know, three or more together. and. Um, writing postcards to people in Congress and doing things like that. And I think that's exciting is that there is this feeling that we can't, no one's coming to save us. This is on all of us to do more than we're doing. Yeah. Um, and can you tell us about the first time you made trouble? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm sure there are other times that my parents would have said I made trouble, but the, the really, I mean, the first time it was really kind of got into my mind, I talk about, because we had moved to, I, I grew up in Texas and, um, I don't know how many of you have ever been to Texas, but my folks were against everything in Texas. That was just kind of how we grew, I grew up in Dallas. And um, my dad was a civil rights, rights lawyer. He actually still is. My mom, um, you know, got into politics. But anyway, we moved. So we moved to Austin because um, I thought it would be a more hospitable place. And I, um, it was the middle of the Vietnam War, and my dad was defending conscientious objectors to the war. And 
So I was in seventh grade, so I decided I would wear a black armband to school um, in protest of the war. Well, at Westlake High School, that was not a popular thing to do. Um, and I was new at school. And I remember the principal, Tom Heston, I remember, I mean, like, I can't remember any <laughs> other people's names probably from that high school, but I remember the principal because he looked at me, he saw my black armband, and he said, will you come to my office? And, I mean, I was one of these perfect students. I mean, I always was a rule follower. I was the first child. I did everything right. And I was like, I can't believe I'm going to go to the principal's office. And he said, do, do your parents know what you're doing? And I said, well, I'm, I'm pretty sure they do, um, <laughs> actually. <laughs> and uh, he said, well, I'm going to call your mom and just check on that. And honest, honest to God, it was the luckiest day of Tom Heston's life that my mother was not on the other end of the phone when he called. Um, but I, you know, I remember it like it was yesterday, and I kind of have to thank him because the simple act of wearing a black armband to make a statement in seventh grade, I got more, you know, I would have never met the principal, right? And it feels like, I think this is like, so it's, I just think it's important to remember that, um, and of course, then other kids came up to me and asked about it. And it's, I think it's just one of these things where getting out there and doing something, even small, I realized you actually can make a statement. And people began to pay attention. And I, then I was hooked. <laughs> that was forevermore. You got that the was, bug. That was just the beginning, right? There was a lot of troublemaking after that. But yeah, that was seventh grade, pivotal moment, which is actually why I loved, I, um, you know, last year went down to Washington for the March for Our Lives organized by young people. And meeting these young people, I remember this young woman I met from Pennsylvania um, who stopped me, and uh, she was, you know, she was in junior high, and she said, you know, I went out, I, um, I asked her about her story, and she said, well, I was the only kid in my school who had to leave, you know, to walk out, and so they suspended me. Um, I said, well, um, good for you. You know, that's really important. I said, then what happened? She said, well, when I went back to school, all the other kids came and said, wow, um, Next time, I'm going with you. Um, so I just think it's, it is so inspiring now to see young people doing things that, um, and not waiting for us to fix things for them. Um, and they deserve all of our credit and support and encouragement. So yeah, invest in young people. That's my other lesson. Yeah, yeah, a lot of times really young people get a bad rap. You know, yeah. this generation, people talk about millennials. They blame them for everything. But you know, there's some great young people who are doing wonderful work. And we see that yeah. here on this campus. And Oh, good. Uh, that's really great. I appreciate those folks who are doing those things. Yeah. Um, but in your 12 years at Planned Parenthood, um, what was your biggest victory or most memorable moment? Oh my God, there were so <laughs> many memorable moments. The good, the highs and the lows. Um, but, uh, and I, I write about this in the book a little bit too. One of the big fights we had was of course the Affordable Care Act, um, which by the way, I guess is just announced today that this government wants to now repeal, again, attempt to repeal. Um, We'll talk about that later, um, but it was really hard to get women's health care included in the Affordable Care Act. Shocking, I know, uh, but I mean, the, the conversations on Capitol Hill were crazy. I, one of my favorite ones was, of course, when we were, the debate was over whether maternity benefits should be covered, and um, because most insurance plans did not cover um, or not, were not required to cover maternity benefits. And a senator from Arizona said, well, he didn't think that they should be required because he was never going to need them. Because um, <laughs> apparently he was past his childbearing years at that point. And, uh, and, but Senator Debbie Stabenow turned right around and said, well, I bet your mother needed them. And, you know, boom, uh, which was beautiful. Like and of course they got in. But anyway, there were a lot of fights about getting women's health care included, but the biggest fight was really uh, over birth control, which is very popular, by the way. Um, millions of people use it every year. Uh, in fact, more than 90% of women use it at some point in their lifetime. But in any case, they didn't want to um, cover it, and so we had to do everything. I mean, we had calls into Congress. I'm sure there's people in this audience who probably <laughs> uh, wrote to their Congress people or called them, and we had you know, students on college campuses gi in gigantic birth control packs, you know, running around and agitating. And then I, so, but I'll never forget the day I was sitting in my office and um, the White House called and said, um, the president, uh, the president's trying to reach you. I love that. It was like, okay, <laughs> clear my calendar. Um, and, uh, and it was President Obama calling to say that he was going to announce that day that from now on birth control would be covered for all people in, in insurance plans in America. And as a result, more than 72 million people now have birth control covered at no cost. And that was revolutionary. Yeah. And that was like amazing, right? Um, but, 
But I think it's important to remember because I also talk about in the book, if you're a progressive, if you're fighting for social justice, you know, I think I.F. Stone actually said this, you, you know, you lose, you lose, you lose, you lose, you lose, and then you win. <laughs> and so it's important to remember that if you're, if you're fighting for really big things, you're going to win more than you're going to lose, but it's worth fighting for the really big things because then that wasn't a result of just our work. That was a result of decades mm -hmm. of work. You know, first legalizing birth control. You know, people went to jail to legalize birth control. So, um, but that was a great moment because um, we're actually now at a record low for teenage pregnancy in the United States of America. Um, and yeah, it was really, that is worth, um, that's worth applauding. And a 30 year low for unintended pregnancy. Um, and I think a large part of that is the ability of folks to access um, family planning services. So I actually want to shout out, I know the plants, there's some Planned Parenthood people in the audience, and I just want to say thank you for what you do here in Iowa every day to provide health care to um, the people of this state. And I also know some of the Emma Goldman Clinic folks are here. So just, anyway, can we just give it up for them? Say thank you. Um, Well, here in Iowa, the Emma Goldman Clinic, um, in conjunction with Planned Parenthood of the Heartland and the ACLU, um, just won a suit against the state against one of the most restrictive anti-abortion yes. laws in the nation. And um, fortunately, Yay! This, All right. yeah. <laughs> so fortunately, that six-week ban was um, deemed unconstitutional. It was struck down on the anniversary of Roe versus Wade. So that was poetic justice. Right. Um, but it's part of a veritable game of whack-a-mole with restrictive um, yeah. state laws. And, uh, but you're no stranger to courtrooms yourself. So can you tell us about your experience testifying before Congress in, in 2015? Oh, sure. That was, so I said there were highs and lows. And that was definitely um, in the lower echelon of the time of Planned Parenthood. But um, for those of you who weren't around or may not remember, but we were under, um, we'd had this series of video sting attacks against Planned Parenthood. And so Congress started investigating Planned Parenthood. In fact, actually, at that time, we had five different congressional committees investigating Planned Parenthood. Now, just for the record, and so you know where Congress's priorities are, that's more than the Enron scandal. That's more than the financial crisis. I mean, we were essentially spending all of our time dealing with a congressional investigation, and which ultimately led to me being asked to come testify um, before Congress, and um, which, you know, I felt like, look, anything I can do to try to tell the American people and any members of Congress will listen about the work of Planned Parenthood, um, I will do that. I quickly learned that the committee hearing was not really a hearing. Mm -hmm. It was really an inquisition. Mm -hmm. And the whole setup was, you know, the minute I walked in and there was like ca cameras everywhere and film crews and, and the whole idea was to try to uh, make me look bad and um, humiliate me. And so it was a series of um, questions about everything, about my competency, my qualifications, my salary, this and that. And, um, but at a certain point I realized the more that these men with very angry, vein popping, you know, kind of finger pointing, the more that you just didn't take the bait, the angrier they got. And so it kind of, I kind of got into this like, ice cool, just like, okay, I'm just going to like relax here and try to let them, you know, sometimes if someone's making a fool of themselves on national television, you just should let them keep the mic. And um, so anyway, it was, so, but it was a very interesting experience. Um, uh, I will, I will admit um, in the middle of the hearing, um, I got a text from my son, Daniel, who always plays this sort of recurring role in my life of uh, coming up with the in most interesting comments. Uh, he, he, he texted me, he said, Mom, I'm so proud of you. You're doing a great job. I'm watching you on TV. I think raising me all those years really helped you prepare for this <laughs> hearing today. <laughs> Which, of course, he was correct. And, um, <laughs> but, um, but at the end of it, it was five plus hours. Um, I guess a couple of things. One is, in, in a strange way, it was an opportunity for millions of people uh, to hear more about what Planned Parenthood does every day. And I could not walk down the street after that without someone stopping me and saying, Planned Parenthood saved my life. Planned Parenthood was there for me in college. Planned Parenthood was there for me when I had no health care. And so it really was um, sort of the great alumni association of Planned Parenthood coming out in force uh, and reminding people how important this health care was and access to affordable health care is. 
Um, and the other thing is I learned you just have to stay in the long game because since that hearing is over, Chairman Jason Chaffetz retired, uh, Trey Gowdy retired, and now um, Elijah Cummings is the chair of that committee and Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez is on that committee right. along with Ayanna Presley and a lot of other women. So I think it's just kind of interesting how um, we, you just have to be focused on the long, the long game. And, uh, but anyway, anyone, if you ever get called before Congress, I'm your gal, just call me, I can get you through it. Yes. Um, well, on a personal note, um, I know for myself, between high school graduation and when I began working at the University of Iowa as a secretary receptionist, I was uninsured. And um, fortunately, I, I found Emma Goldman Clinic, you know, the old school way in the yellow pages. Right. And um, <laughs> so then I, that's who I went to for, you know, health care for exactly. about yeah. six years. And um, I would have never believed that I would end up on the board, you know, years later. So um, but what do you say to people who underestimate the power of places like Emma Goldman Clinic or Planned Parenthood for um, providing care for the uninsured and not just abortion services, but health care, you know, everything. at large? Right, everything. Well, I actually think in, in a strange way, I mean, that's, that was sort of what we had to do at Planned Parenthood. And I, I know the, the folks here in Iowa know that is like every time you get under attack, you have to sort of, as, as Don Legans, who worked with me for years at Planned Parenthood, say, like, if, if the idea is to, to take lemons and make lemonade, we were like a lemonade factory at Planned Parenthood because we were always under attack. But she was really good at, as are a lot of folks, at turning that an opportunity to educate people about what's what's going on, what we do, the health care we provide, um, you know, how important that, that care is, and lifting up the voices of our patients. That, to me, has become... Uh, fortunately, we have something more than the Yellow Pages now. We have the internet, and I think the opportunity now to lift up the voices of folks um, that do receive care has become absolutely critical. And I think a, you know, a, a huge part of the entire healthcare movement now is actually uh, telling people's lived experiences. But the other thing, and I write about this in the book too, is one of the lessons, I have many Ann Richards lessons in the book, um, because she had a lot of opinions and, uh, and a lot of good advice. but. She was, uh, because she was in politics, she was very strongly of the, of the point of view of like, it's, you have to, you know, repetition is your friend. And it's only when you are completely sick of saying something that someone else has finally heard it, right? And so I think the other thing we underestimate, um, and actually I'll tell you, it's kind of funny because when I first went to Planned Parenthood, um, uh, people, um, well, I didn't actually know that much about everything we did. Honestly, I was kind of like the, the general public. And, um, but when we started getting under attack, I realized, okay, we have to go on the offense. And we have to start telling people um, about all the care we provide, you know, and uh, the millions of people that count on us, and particularly when we were being defunded, that, that that paid for preventive care, cancer screenings, birth control, STI testing and treatment, vital care. And I was just like over and over and over. Uh, and it was really, you know, just felt like, I can't believe I'm saying this again, but it was important. And finally, it kind of began to break through because I remember one night, Glenn Beck, who had a, I think he had a TV show. That, I know, I'm sorry. But uh, <laughs> he, had, he, was on, he was on TV or on radio. He said, you know, uh, oh, you, you don't, um, we don't need Planned Parenthood because only hookers go to Planned Parenthood. And I remember so clearly because I was about to go on Rachel Maddow that night and a woman wrote in on our website. She said, He's such an ignoramus. I never tell you that part, but she did. She wrote that. She said, he doesn't realize that us military wives here in North Carolina go to Planned Parenthood when the doctor on base can't see us. And I felt like that was really a breakthrough moment um, because it just, folks began to say, this is actually the difference it, it made in my life. Um, and then, uh, of course, um, uh, uh, Stephen Colbert couldn't like let it go after that. And he said, because, um, then Fox and Friends said, well, we, you don't, no one needs Planned Parenthood. They can just go to Walgreens um, for their pap smears. <laughs> and uh, so Stephen Colbert put on, you know, he said, like, women, great news. You don't need Planned Parenthood. You can go and get your pap smears. They're just between the Swiffer refills and the cat food. Um, and then Walgreens had to put out a, a big announcement. like, please do not come to us for, for your pap smears. Um, but I remember then going, uh, go, whenever I go to an event, um, someone would say to me, did you know that 97% of Planned Parenthood services are preventive care? You need to start saying that more. And I was like, I guess it's finally getting through, right? So anyway, the long-winded way of saying, I think sometimes we just have to remember that 
the things that we're, the facts that we're living with every single day are not part of people's everyday lives. And so just repeat, 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 rinse, repeat again. <laughs> Well, thank you for that. Yeah. Thank you for everything that Planned Parenthood does. No, thank the people of Planned Parenthood and the Emma Goldman Clinic for the things they do, because that's really where the work gets done. Yeah. All right. Well, I also wanted to uh, mention you, your father, who was a civil rights attorney. And um, while Brown, you also worked on um, anti-apartheid efforts. Right. And you even earned your honorary degree the same time Nelson Mandela did. So it's you know, very impressive. So you, you definitely know the fundamental um, understanding of allyship. Mm -hmm. um, that being said, uh, what can be done right now in the fight for black maternal health um, and when mortality rates for black women are three times that of uh, white, their white counterparts? Right. This is an issue that is obsessing um, me and I know a lot of other women. And it's one is that maternal mortality rates are going up in the US. This is unbelievable. And in fact, the figures now, I see a lot of heads nodding, so this isn't news to this crowd, but I think it, I mean, estimates now are that for women, um, uh, women are twice as likely to die from maternal complications than their mothers were. This is outrageous um, at this day and time, and particularly for women of color and black women in particular. Uh, and it's something I talk about a lot, I write about a lot, I think we have to continue to talk about. And I actually wrote kind of a, I wrote something that I think it kind of irritated some people. I was in, um, just that right now, you know, everyone's obsessed about the Mueller report. And yes, it should be made public. It should be made public. All the public, this is our report, right? This is our government. Mm -hmm. I agree. And I wish that cable news would talk about issues that are actually really of concern to women right now, like the fact that maternal mortality rates are going up, uh, like the fact that we have no national child care policy in this country, like the fact that two thirds of minimum wage workers are women. And for those of them who are moms, they're spending two thirds of their salary on child care. These are the issues that when I'm going around the country and listening to women, this is what's on their mind. And why is the government not talking about any of these issues? And so I guess, uh, I don't mean to get kind of hot and bothered here, but that's really what I'm focused on now, is how do we make sure, particularly in this presidential debate, I know you guys are seeing every single presidential wannabe um, in Iowa, yay for you. But I, I uh, which is great, it's so fantastic. Um, it's fantastic, but I want to hear not just the women running for president, I want to hear everybody running for president talk about issues that are fundamental to women's lives and their economic and their healthcare access and their equality and their equal pay. And I can't wait until those issues um, are front and center uh, like other things that are being talked about. So, um, so you're raising a really important issue. I think there's a whole set of issues that, um, that are deeply concerning to women and that seem to be sort of um, not in the political water. So maybe you guys can do your part here in Iowa of raising them in town forums, and I just think that's what we need to do. Yeah. yeah. Well, black maternal health. Oh, yeah. Some questions coming up. Um, black maternal health um, week is coming up soon, but then there's also gathering voices. Mm -hmm. um, there's a black maternal health event coming up, so Great. keep your eyes out for that. We're going to get some good. things posted. Um, oh, yeah, I was actually going to get to this one, but um, it says. Uh, you mentioned your granddad owned a seed company in Iowa. What was the name? Yes. <laughs> oh, my God. I know. My family was from Shenandoah. Do you guys know where that is? <laughs> Someone is from Shenandoah. <laughs> it was the Henry Field Seed Company. <laughs> you all know more than I do. Um, really? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, my, 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 on my dad's side, um, my mom's side came from nothing. They just came up out of the dirt. I don't know. <laughs> we never could figure. I mean, it was just. So mom was kind of like, it's like my parents um, both grew up in Waco, Texas, and they were like from opposite side of the track. So it's just so, so like a sort of classic um, story. In fact, my, my um, they fell in love in high school. And my, my grandparents were desperate to get my father away from my mother. So they sent, her, sent him away to boarding school in Andover, and he lasted like six weeks, and then he came back. So they were just in love. Um, but anyway, that's a whole other story. But, uh, but my grandmother and my, uh, my, um, her, her um, brother-in-law were both on the board of Grinnell College. And um, in fact, I think there's still Reed Hall uh, at Grinnell, and that was my, I guess that was my maternal great-grandmother. So I got some Iowa roots somewhere. Anyone who wants to go to Shenandoah, let me know. I'd love to go back and see it. And, um, but, uh, 
They were, they were amazing women, actually, that came out of Iowa, you know, went to college. My grandmother went to Radcliffe. It was, like, unheard of. It was, she was so worldly, and I write about her in my book because I feel like she was just, um, she was such a progressive. I mean, you know, helped start the League of Women Voters in Texas. She brought all these great Iowa values to Texas. She was just as out of place as the rest of us. <laughs> anyway, thank you, Iowa, for that. <laughs> it was and great. then your daughter Lily spent some time in Iowa in Des Moines when she was uh, working on. Yes, on she Hillary did. Clinton. She lived right around the corner from Reagan. Uh, I have more Reagan T-shirts than everybody <laughs> in this room combined. Um, <laughs> But she, uh, yeah, she went to work for Hillary and was her was in charge of press or communications uh, for the Iowa caucuses. So I've learned everything um, that most that I probably will ever need to know about the Iowa caucuses. But she loved it here, I loved it, um, uh -huh. absolutely. Speaking you... of having too many Reagan shirts. Oh, my God. <laughs> that would get, oh. I have a little something for you. Really? And, some M and some MS swag, too. Oh, so, my gosh. You know. Thank you so much. Yeah, even though I have a lot, I can't have too many Reagan oh, yeah, shirts. I'm a big fan. Ray gun shirts. Oh, thank you. <laughs> All right, so um, well, speaking of your daughter working on um, Hillary Clinton's campaign, yeah. um, outside of Planned Parenthood, you were a co-founder of America Votes. Can you talk about the founding of this organization and the importance of coalition building, especially as we face the 2020 election? Sure, um, and I do talk about found founding America Votes, but it was, it was a, a recognition um, that was actually during the, um, the Bush re-election that the progressive groups, I came out of labor, but there were folks in the environmental movement, the women's movement, the LGBTQ movement, and everything um, and we were none of us coordinated everyone just kind of went out there did their thing and I remember a friend of mine he said I'm just gonna collect all the mail that I get from every group and like pile it up and show how completely crazy this is we're all spending our same money talking to the same people and so what if we all got together and actually kind of pooled our lists and our targets and so that's how America votes began and it still exists uh, and in many states, that's how progressive groups do organize around things like voter registration. But the idea was simply, we can't just talk to each other. We have got to expand. And I think, too, it was also recognition that um, that's how you actually build relationship. It was amazing to me, actually, when we the first meeting of America Votes, that many of the national progressive leaders had never even met each other, and they all lived in Washington, D.C. Now, at the local level, that's different. I think that that happens more organically. Um, but I will say some of those relationships um, really became important after this last election when people realized that everyone was going to have to pull together and that you couldn't just fight the fight that you were on. And I remember, I mean, we could never have made it at Planned Parenthood without the solidarity of so many progressive organizations um, for whom health care, reproductive health care was not their main issue. And, um, because that was kind of the first fight out of the barrel, you know, because, you know, Paul Ryan, then Speaker Paul Ryan, um, you know, said that this was going to be, he was going to have a, a, you know, a bill on the president's desk right away that it defunded Planned Parenthood and repealed the Affordable Care Act. So it was, it was the first thing up, and people just came out of the woodwork everywhere. Um, but I'll, uh, this other thing I've never forgotten is that after that, I mean, it was such a fight, and I'm sure all of you who were involved in that know, it was just like thousands and thousands of phone calls and people going to Washington and um, all of this. And then, the, of course, that pivotal moment when John McCain made his famous, you know, and we won, which is a great lesson to me, which is like never give up because you never know. We never had the votes. We never had the votes. I remember being that night outside of the Capitol in the dark, everyone standing there just waiting to see. And it was like there was no way we could win. I remember Patty Murray from Seattle saying to me, Susan, I just, I don't think we can do it. And then we did. So never give up. <laughs> that's, I mean, I think that's, um, I don't even know where I was going with that, but that was such an important <laughs> lesson. I mean, I just think it's one of those things, I guess you, um, you learn as a progressive, um, so we can keep going. Sorry, I could tell stories forever. I'll stop. It was great. I love it. <laughs> no, but it's just, it's, um, yeah. Anyway. So in your career, it can be frustrating um, and overwhelming when you feel like you're continuing to fight the same fights over and over and over. Yeah. So what does self-care look like for Cecile Richards? <laughs> <laughs> I'm a pie baker. That's it. Yeah, yeah <laughs> basically. And then once I made a bunch of pies, then I started making my own pasta. <laughs> so I just... Yeah, it's it's really fun. Are there some other people here who've made pasta? 
it's actually so therapeutic. Um, and, I, and I love to cook with my kids. So I have these twins, Hannah and Daniel, and then Lily, and they're all bakers, and um, it's just what we do together. So that to me is, is, really, is really fun. Um, but uh, can I give you a great quote? This is oh, another Ann Richards favorite um, about, uh, Edna St. Vincent Millay wrote that, life isn't one thing after another, it's the same damn thing over and over again. <laughs> <laughs> and so, yeah, don't think you're crazy. It actually, that is life. Um, and you lose and you lose and you lose and then you win, right? So that's, I think we have to remember that too. <laughs> Well, it's funny that you were talking about um, kind of Ann Richards-isms. Yes. When I was listening to the audio book, there was this quote that it was like, um, uh, you can put lipstick on a pig and call it Monique, and it's still... <laughs> oh, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> and so I had heard that quote before, but never the Monique part. So like, I like went back. I did like the 30 seconds back. I was like, oh, did she say <laughs> <laughs> So I was, <laughs> was going to ask oh, you about dear. your favorite Ann Richards-isms, but um, oh, I'm yeah. sure you could just go on. There's so many. No, there's so, so, there's so many, and I don't want to spoil the book for anyone who wants to read it but uh, she yeah I mean she again she was able look she was such an unlikely governor of Texas she was a recovering alcoholic she was divorced she was a liberal and any one of those things would pretty much knock you out and um, and of course it wasn't like the Democratic Party came to her and said you're the one we've been waiting for. <laughs> that did not happen. Um, she had to. She had to run against men in her primary. It was brutal. It was ugly, um, and she just did it anyway. You know, she did it even when they said she. You know, you can't. And I. That's what I loved about about mom. Um, but uh, I. And I think that. But one of the things too that I learned from her is, um, as she used to say, people voted for her um, worse than all. That's a, that's a Texas kind of phrase, is this that she never tried to be anything she wasn't. She just tried to be um, um, kind of tell it like it is. And folks like that um, for about four years. <laughs> and then they vote, <laughs> and then they elected George Bush. But anyway, um, I mean, she was always a little too progressive uh, for the state, I suppose. Actually, there's a funny thing about um, after mom got beat, um, she and Mario Cuomo, Cuomo got beat that same year. For those of you who remember him, he was the governor of New York, and they were both. They were probably, I think they were the two most high-profile governors in the in the country. And um, but it was a terrible year for Democrats. It was the you know it was sort of the Newt Gingrich um, wave, and so they both got beat. So Doritos um, called and said they wanted to do a, a, an ad with them uh, about the Super Bowl, and um, and I know Mom's calling me, and she's like. I don't know, Cecile, they want to pay me a bunch of money to do a Doritos ad. I said, okay, whatever. You know, you don't have a job, you don't have a car, you don't have a place to live, and you're definitely not moving in with us, so, you know. So, um, so, they, uh, so they do the ad, and it's really funny, because they were good friends, and they were, like, really funny together. So, uh, anyway, that was, in, I guess, in January when the Super Bowl was, or whenever the Super Bowl is. And uh, so, um, like, a couple of weeks later, I was in a... Um, I, we were in the elevator together, Mom and I are in New York City, and I hear these two women whispering behind each other, and one saying to the other, I think that's the former governor of Texas. And the other woman says, no, 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 that's that woman in the Doritos ad. <laughs> yes. Which is when I thought, why did we run those political commercials? We should have just run Doritos ads. <laughs> and in a strange way, that's who we have in the White House, right? <laughs> it's like, you know, that's TV is uh, TV is TV. So, oh well, anyway, that was totally off the subject, but <laughs> well, you and your mom are both I absolutely iconic. And so, in honor of Women's History Month, who are some of your other feminist or womanist icons? Oh my gosh. I mean, there's a million. Although, I have to say Emma Goldman, yeah. I don't know I read, when I started being a union organizer, um, when I was uh, right out of college, I read Emma Goldman's um, autobiography, and it, it was just, I'll never forget it. It was, I mean, what a, you talk about a badass, uh, and just like uh, doing, and, and I think just how she talked about bringing joy to organizing and, and the responsibility of getting back. So I, I, I always love a good Emma Goldman story. Um, but I, I guess, look, I love all these women going to Congress. 
I just, and there's so many of them. In fact, um, tomorrow night we're going to be in Washington, D.C. with Lauren Underwood. This is a young woman. Yeah, she's amazing, right? She, she also didn't get tapped by the Democratic Party. She ran against six men in her primary and beat them all, and then went on and beat an incumbent in the general election. Youngest African-American woman to ever go to Congress, all right? So, um, but I also think it's important that there are these amazing women in Congress, and they're just, they're, they're not waiting, you know, they're not waiting their turn. They're just out there. But I also think, I guess my, my hero, heroines, too, are the women who aren't going to go to Congress, but who are doing the work every day. And I feel like one of the things that isn't covered enough in the news right now um, is that women are 54% of the voters, right? Um, and if we're 54% of the voters in 2020, I think we'll change the direction of the country. Uh, women are the volunteers. They've been leading the resistance, whether it's on family separation, whether it's, um, and, and you know, it's funny that we're near Cedar Rapids. I, I recently went on kind of a listening tour and I remember, um, you know, a woman from Cedar Rapids saying to me, I, look, I've, I've been doing this work all my life. I know I'm, I'm going to, this election, I'll do the phone banks, I'll do the, I'll do the uh, block walking, but I'm basically working in a system that wasn't built for me, for women um, to participate. And I think this is time um, to lift up the women who are doing the everyday work to change this country, because it's going to take more than, this is, to me, the most powerful leadership in this country isn't coming from Washington, it's coming from women at the grassroots. And we just need to applaud them and lift them up um, and support them, because they're going to change. I think, I think they're changing everything. Yeah, so that's, um, Thank you so much. Those were the questions I had, and then it looks like we have a stack here to get through, too. Okay. So let's take a crack at it. Um, what books are on your bookshelf these days, and what book would you recommend? Other than, you know. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> um, oh, my God. I just, um, I'm in the middle of a book called Heavy. Oh, Kiese Lehman. It's amazing. He, he did a visiting, um, he was like a visiting um, uh, professor in the writing program here. Uh, oh, last, is that right? Last year. Amazing. It's amazing. I mean, I haven't finished it, so I just have to admit, I'm halfway through it, but it's incredible. Um, about a young man <laughs> growing up in the South. Um, so I recommend that. I, I was actually just saying to Lauren, my, actually, my co-author, Lauren Peterson, right here hey. from Wisconsin. Um, <laughs> we're, <laughs> we're just, I was just saying to Lauren on the plane, I have like 900 books that I'm like halfway, halfway through. So <laughs> that's I'll life stop in Iowa that. City. It's, it's like terrible. you always no, have I know. something I just on the feel go. Like I need to stop and read um, for, for a bit. But I do think it's exciting. I mean, one of the other things that's, is exciting is so many women writing books now, and so I mean, there's there's like a million a million to choose from. But that's that's one I'm reading right now. All right. It's been two plus years of the Trump administration and the GOP yeah. war on women. Uh, many of us are persisting and resisting, but it is difficult, especially in these last few days, to keep fighting. What do you do to keep yourself motivated? And, oh, what do you do for self-care? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But I think also, it, it, like an important point, because I used to be a big, like, um, kind of poo-poo the whole idea of self-care. Um, in fact, I write about it some in the book. Because, I don't know, when you come out of a labor movement, like, self-care is like, like, that is not talked about, right? You just got to be hard and go and all that. And I think I have, um, I, I have recognized, particularly this last two years, that um, people do need to take care of each other a lot more. Because even if you yourself can keep going, the, the, the harm that's being inflicted on other folks right now, mm -hmm. people of color, LGBTQ people, Muslims, immigrants, um, it's tremendous. And so I just feel like we have to really think about um, how we take care of each other in a way that I don't know that I've really had thought about as much before. And the other thing I think to the point of the, the questioner is that this is a long haul. This isn't, even if we should, this election in a couple of years should change who's in the White House, the damage that's been done is, is gonna take a long time. And so I really think it's important that we find ways to build um, community with each other, as I'm sure you do here in Iowa City, and that um, we recognize that we gotta take care of each other for a while. Um, but I hope we also feel, and then again, the other, I guess the only other self-care thing I think is, 
You just have to have a sense of humor and find joy in this work. Otherwise, you're not going to make it, right? Sometimes you just have to laugh at the ridiculous things, sometimes that are coming out on Twitter or whatever else, and just not get too serious about it because some of this stuff is just crazy. And, um, and, I, and I, again, I think that's why women went to the Women's March. All the research shows that half the reason women went is to feel like they weren't crazy, right? That there were other people that thought, this is nuts. Um, so I think it's, you've got to kind of keep a sense of humor and find some joy along the way. All right. And what would you consider one of the most um, important reproductive justice issues that doesn't get enough attention? Mm. Well, I'll tell you one, my favorite one right now, which is that, and you may be aware of this, but this... This administration has just issued a domestic gag order. Okay, this is this has never happened in this country. Um, it would essentially prevent clinicians and doctors, medical providers, from giving information to their patients about um, legal abortion, referring them. Uh, it would basically deny medical providers the ability to live up to the Hippocratic Oath to take care of the people that, they're, that come, them, come to serve them. This is unbelievable. And we've talked about the global gag order. Most people are familiar with that. In every administration, it goes back and forth, depending on if it's a Democrat or Republican, which has harmed millions and millions and millions of people around the world. But now we're going to see this here. And what, what the idea, obviously, is to prevent um, anybody that provides access to safe and legal abortion, which is legal in this country, is still legal in this country, prevent them from participating in the family planning program. And Planned Parenthood actually provides 40% of the care through the National Family Planning Program, and this would essentially prevent anyone from going to Planned Parenthood um, under that program. So that's, and, and that is an issue that is going to affect women of color, women with low incomes, people with low incomes, more than anyone else. And so we have just, it, it's um, really frightening. Sorry to bring you down after I said bring joy and fun into the thing, but that's, people need to be aware of this. Yes. Yeah. And how can we better incorporate and involve men in reproductive rights efforts? Well, first, can I just say, there's so many men here tonight. Can we just give it up for them? Thank you. I love that. Um, that's, I mean, that's exciting. Um, Look, uh, well, as we know, reproductive issues are not just women's issues. They're everyone's issues. And, I mean, I'm really actually proud at Planned Parenthood, the fastest growing population coming to us for health care um, were young men. And so I think it's, it's important that, one, because women can't, do, women can't do it all, and because these are issues that are everyone's issues and they're family's issues, uh, we have to talk about it in those ways. And one of my, this is like kind of just my own little dream, is that I feel like, a generational shift is happening. I can test this out with you guys and you can tell me if it's true or not. But I feel like for men of this generation that are having kids now um, and raising families, they really want their daughters and expect that their daughters are going to have every opportunity that their sons have. And that was not true in my, my dad's, my parents' generation. Um, I mean, they... My dad was like fine, but it wasn't like he really had aspirations for me. And so I think that this is one way that men can really be involved now is fight for your daughters to have the same opportunities um, that your sons do. And that includes the ability to make your own decisions about childbearing. And so I just think that um, we need more dads to be speaking up for their daughters. So maybe that's one way. And their granddaughters. That was one of the exciting things about being at the march in Washington, um, the Women's March, is like how many fathers and grandfathers and sons and brothers and you know, nephews uh, were there, um, because it is going to take all of us. Uh, and then someone also asked, um, I noticed the lack of young women having the same passion and fight for women's rights as older women. How can we make, uh, make trouble fun to appeal to young women and teens? So I'm going to just disagree in that I am just seeing young women exploding everywhere. And that was actually a big part of my work at Planned Parenthood, something I felt so strongly about. Because one of the things I will say is, um, well, two things. One is, if you want young people to be involved in a movement, you've got to invest in them. And that means provide them opportunities to volunteer, provide trainings, provide convenings. That's how we grew Planned Parenthood from 3 million supporters to more than 12 million, is we brought young people in. Um, so that's number one, is you know, if you're a nonprofit or you're a movement, look at where you're putting your money 
And if you're not putting a lot of it into young people, then you're probably not going to get as many into the door. And 4 million young people turn 18 every single year. All right? So my math, which is not as good as it used to be, but that means there are 16 million young people who will not have been eligible to vote last time. They're going to be eligible this time. And they're our future. Okay? So invest in them. And the second thing is um, you got to make space for young people. Because, and it's part of the reason I left Planned Parenthood, is I, like, I have the best job in the world as far as I'm concerned. I had it for more than 12 years. But I thought, you know what? Um, it's time for me to move aside, because I can do this work, I'll keep doing this work for the rest of my life, but I need to make room for somebody else. And so I think one of the things that, whether it's putting young people on boards, whether it's hiring them, whether it's mentoring them, um, lifting them up, letting them speak at the events, whatever it is, Give young people an opportunity to shine and grow. And don't be surprised when they challenge you. Because young people don't want to just sit at the table. They actually want to be heard. And I just think we can do, we can do more. But I am so excited. I feel like young people are on fire in this country. And the cool thing is to see young people and folks of other generations now doing this work together. To me, that's, that's the future. Yeah. So. I, and I'm sure there's some young people here, so you should like see a young person tonight and say, thank you for being here, okay, with all of us old people. <laughs> hey, I did an icebreaker at Emma Goldman Clinic um, not too long ago, and it was about um, who was the first president that you voted for. And a remarkable amount of them said, oh, um, I think it was President Obama's second term. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, definitely a lot of young people involved, so that kind of got me in my feelings a little yeah, bit. Yeah, that's cool. Uh, <laughs> I love that. Um, so do you have a favorite um, 2020 candidate so far? Um, I don't, but I like a lot of them. And I really, uh, I mean, in, in all, you know, in all transparency, my daughter is Kamala Harris's communications director, so I'm like, love Kamala. But I also love a lot of people running, and I'm excited that there are so many good, smart people that are um, in this race, and that all of them are coming to Iowa, and you all will be able to <laughs> discern much more. Um, but, um, and I think it's, I mean, obviously it's going to be a robust primary. Um, but, and I don't know what was, I don't know where people are in this room, but um, I think it is not a given that this election is going to um, go one way or the other. There is a lot of work to do. And um, so uh, I'll just say that no matter who comes out of this primary, um, it's going to be important for people who want to change in the country to work like the Dickens for that person, because um, it's it's not going to be easy. I mean, you all live in Iowa. You know this. Yeah, we've got a lot of work to do. Um, and the last one we have is, what is the most gratifying thing about doing events like this one? <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, it's just, I love, I, I live in New York City now, which is kind of crazy, because I'm from Texas, so I don't fit in at all. I love coming to Iowa. <laughs> That's my the most exciting thing is, and some of you all get to meet maybe when we do book signing. I like to hear what you're doing. Um, people just jazz me up. And so I love getting out and getting to hear what's happening um, around the countryside. Because again, I just, I'm a grassroots organizer at heart. I've been so blessed that I could spend my life being an organizer. And nothing excites me more than being out and hearing what's on, on people's minds. Because I just, I really believe that's where change is going to happen. It's not from the top down, it's from the bottom up. So. Um, I guess I just want to say thank you, um, you know, Monique, for, I'm sorry about that, that pig thing for my mother. I don't know what, uh, what was I thinking. The, yeah. Um, uh, and I, I want to thank, I mean, I thank you guys for coming out tonight, and thank you for all you're doing to change the country, because it's going to take all of us. And um, thank you to the Public Library. Um, thank you to Prairie Lights. Um, I don't know. It's just great to see you. This is awesome. So, <laughs> well, thank you so much. Yeah. For, for yeah. Thank you for having me. Yeah. This has been such a wonderful Thank you. Thanks a lot.